Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Le let me welcome you to this conference call being hosted by the, this press conference, sorry, being hosted by the People's National Party, where we're gonna be dealing with issues related to the COVID-19 coronavirus. We have decided to use this medium via Zoom to play our role in reducing the interactions between persons and reducing the possibility of the spread of the coronavirus. I'm Julian Robinson, the General Secretary. On the call, we have our opposition spokesman on finance, Mark Golden, um, our opposition spokesman on education, Peter Bontin, our opposition spokesman on health, Dr. Maurice Guy, and we're going to be joined very shortly by our opposition spokesman on foreign affairs and foreign trade, Lisa Hanna. Um, the format that we're taking, we're going to have comments from each of our spokespersons, and then we will invite and allow the media to ask questions after. So is everybody, just so we can check in, is everybody hearing me, seeing me, and everybody's on? Members of the media? Hello? Hearing me? Everybody's hearing me? Okay, I see Siobhan has responded that he's hearing me. Okay, um, I'm going to invite Mark Golden to start by outlining um, some proposals that the party has that we believe can aid in the economic challenges that we believe lie ahead in relation to COVID-19. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Julian. Good afternoon, everyone. The events surrounding this coronavirus pandemic have unfolded rapidly and the situation changes from day to day. We know for, as a fact that the Jamaica's tourism industry, which is a major industry in the country, one of the big, biggest employers of labor, of labor in the country, is going through a process of virtual shutdown and it is going to have a major impact, spin-off impact on all sorts of persons, hotel workers, obviously, but also all sorts of businesses and employees of businesses that rely on the tourism um, for their income and their sustenance. We feel that we're also seeing, we're told, downturns in the volume of remittances, and we've seen the retail trade also um, being impacted. As a result, we feel that the government has to move swiftly to put in place a robust fiscal response to the crisis that we are in. We believe that that response has to be upfronted um, to stay ahead of the curve and avoid um, the kind of social fallout that may happen if we do not act quickly. We Note what the Minister of Finance has said about a $25 billion fiscal stimulus arising out of the budget and the arrangements that he has subsequently announced. We would point out that of that 25 billion, 15 billion is really in the form of a tax break through the GCT rate reduction, the MSME tax credit, both of which will be um, rolled out and enjoyed over the life of the fiscal year, the 12 months beginning on April 1. Therefore, that the, the impact on the present and unfolding needs of the population will be somewhat limited. We feel that uh, upfront measures, as I've said, will be critical to put in place an adequate social safety net for the population, especially those groups that will be adversely impacted. Um, the total uh, volume of upfront measures that he has now announced um, is $10 billion, roughly half a percent of GDP. Uh, we feel that that is not going to be adequate to, um, uh, to mitigate the fallout um, and keep the society on a stable footing over the coming weeks. We would like to suggest um, some ideas for consideration, which we feel would be helpful. We have noted what he has announced yesterday 
um, the idea of cash transfers to businesses in targeted sectors based on the number of workers that they keep employed. And we um, agree with that. And he also mentioned cash transfers to persons who are laid off after March the 10th during the coronavirus crisis. And we would also um, welcome that. But we do not feel that these proposals go far enough. Jamaica has a large informal economy. And as economic activity contracts sharply, the impact on micro businesses and life on the ground in virtually every sector is likely to be severe. So we have some proposals that we are calling for. First of all, we would like to see a mitigation grant of $50,000 per PATH family as a special cash benefit to be distributed through PATH. This could be distributed over a two to three month period. Um, we feel that this will put cash resources in the hands of those who need it most and would benefit 100,000 families, 300,000 persons, and would be a substantial um, safety net for the population at the very bottom of society who will be impacted by the contraction in the economy. We are also calling for a special increase of $5 million per constituency for the welfare allocation under the CDF for the period of the crisis. And this could be disbursed through the Social Development Commission. As you know, members of parliament have no uh, um, control over the funds themselves. We, the funds are disbursed through state agencies to ensure that the funds are used for the purposes intended. This um, increase in, this, in the CDF, the Constituency Development Fund of $5 million per month, will go some way to allow um, the representatives of the people on the ground to respond to cases of severe hardship on a timely basis as they present, and they are already starting to present. And this will help to fill the gaps in the overall social safety net that the country has. We'd also uh, reiterate the call for a rollback of GCT on hand sanitizers, soap, disinfectant wipes, sprays, and other personal hygiene products that are recommended for constant regular use during this crisis. And we would also call for a GCT rollback on the recommended medications, paracetamol um, and other medications for persons who become symptomatic and need to um, have these medicines to ease the, um, the, the pain that they will be going through. We would also ask in terms of employment issues um, for a moratorium on payroll statutory contributions during the crisis in the targeted industries that are most affected. This will assist businesses to keep persons employed and this would be an additional measure to go along with the two that the minister mentioned yesterday. This, the statutory contributions are a substantial cost to employers and a moratorium on those during the period of crisis will assist them to keep their workers employed. We feel that this is a collection of measures that will together um, help to ensure that the society as a whole um, is not totally um, tra traumatized and doesn't fragment under the pressure of the very severe economic downturn that is now unfolding. And we think that it's important to do this so as to minimize risks of social unrest and to ensure that the economy can bounce back as quickly as possible when the crisis lifts, as we all hope it will in short order. But we do not know how long this will last and we do not know how bad it will get. What we do know is that the negative impact of it is already manifesting and it's manifesting quickly and a robust fiscal response is necessary to keep the society together. I would now pass back to Julian and um, he can introduce the next post for you. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to turn over to um, Maurice Guy, who is our spokesperson on health, to outline some of our proposals. And then I'll go to Peter Bunting after Maurice Guy. Good afternoon, everyone. The challenge that we are having now is that they, there are seemingly not enough modalities of treatment in Jamaica. And we have had situations where we know as a fact that the World Health Organization has declared by the Director General 
that there should be increased testing. In fact, his exact words were testing, testing, testing. And that is the only way we can get to the, to the numbers that are there because in his words, if you do not test enough, you will not know the volume or the, the level of infections that you're dealing with and subsequently will be unable to plan. Our recommendation to the, to the ministry and to the government is that whereas we recognize that the capacity at the National Viral Laboratory at the University Hospital of the West Indies does not have the capacity to do all the testing that we need. In fact, they have done just um, under 100 tests so far. Um, we have been told that they have gotten 2,500 more kits. But the extent to which this problem will balloon in the country as a result of community spread means that their capacity will be overwhelmed. And I think this is a point that needs to be shared with the Jamaican people. So our proposal is that there are cheaper testing um, kits available out there on the market. And we are recommending to the ministry and to the government that they should do, to get some of these kits, do a parallel testing at the university hospital, our laboratory, to test with a patient with both kits to see if you get convergence of the results. And if you are satisfied that the sensitivity is sufficient, then you will procure cheaper testing so that the country will have the benefit of a greater number of persons being tested. It is something that we are urging the government to look at. And I know that the ministry, the minister has been advised of this particular cheaper testing, but they have not acted on it so far. Secondly, the Cuban authorities have developed, the medical team in Cuba have developed a drug interferon alpha 2B, which is the, the drug that has been used in China so far with very significant um, results. In fact, they are quoted as having 1,500 patients who have been treated by uh, using this interferon for COVID-19 disease with very, very successful um, results. Other countries have gone and have used it too, and Jamaica is one that does not have that now. The leader of the opposition said yesterday in his, in his budget presentation that the, he has made contact with the Cuban authorities and they're only waiting on a request from the Jamaican government now to be able to give some of this um, drug to the Jamaican populace, the Jamaican health authorities, so that in the event we have cases where there are severe um, infections leading to respiratory distress, that the, the length of time that it will take for these patients to get better can be considerably shortened by the use of this um, drug interferon. And we urge the government to act on this particular proposal because at the end of the day, it is the lives of our Jamaican people who will be affected. And if we can find a way, whether it is, it is from the established um, drug producers or not, then it has to be. The minister was heard to say yesterday at his press conference that we have to look at our standards branch to determine whether that drug is effective, efficacious or not. Normally we rely on the US FDA and um, to determine sometimes whether our drugs are safe for use here, although we have our own committee that needs. But I would urge that particular committee to look at what has happened across, to look at the papers that have been presented in relation to the use of this particular drug and urgently come to a decision where approval can be given for the country to start using it. So these are the two main recommendations we have. There are others which have been elaborated already, but I'll just touch on one or two briefly. That is the need to ensure that our frontline workers have adequate protection, protection, protection um, by pr providing them with adequate PPEs, personal protective equipment, which are gloves, um, suits, and face masks, as well as eye, eye, eye screens, so that in their treating of these uh, potential cases, they might themselves not become infected. The, 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 the risk we run if we do not do that is we will have a situation where all our frontline workers run the risk of coming down with this infection. We're already short of nurses, we're already short of doctors in both the public health system and in private sector some, in some instances. So if you have a significant number of these doctors 
who would have to start either being quarantined in national facilities or isolated or being quarantined at home, what will happen is that you will have a significantly diminished numbers to attend to the nation's ill persons when we have peaked. So it is vitally important that we protect them at this particular phase of the illness so they do not fall part of the, of the, of the numbers of persons who are infected. And I think this particular point has been, been missed for some time now. If you do not adequately protect your doctors and nurses, you run the risk that at the, the height of the infection, you may not have sufficient persons manning the posts at the hospital, the health centers, and all the isolation and quarantine areas that you would need. So it is critically and vitally important that the government looks in this particular area to ensure that we protect our frontline workers. Um, I will uh, reserve any more comments for, for questioning later, and I will now hand back to Julian. Thank you very much, Maurice. Um, I'm going to invite Peter, our spokesman on education, to outline some proposals he has, particularly for the most vulnerable students. Peter. Thanks, Julian. Uh, one of the challenges facing the school community now is the uh, lack of an ability to plan. The announcement was made that schools will be closed for two weeks. But I think it's already clear, especially given the proximity to the Easter holidays, that we're going to be out for a much longer period of time, probably at least six weeks uh, in the first instance. So in terms of planning to deal with this uh, interruption of the, of the school term, it, if we accept and the government shares that at least six weeks is a more likely time frame, then the mitigating factors that uh, the Ministry of Education and principals will put into play will take that into account. So for example, we have uh, the nutrition in school program or, this, or the support for nutrition in schools. The nutri buns and little packets of milk are being delivered to schools now. This provides a significant logistical challenge um, for the principals, for the administrators to deliver these to the kids. And it hardly makes sense for children to take, especially those who live you know, some distance from the school, to, to incur the cost of the transportation to come to school to collect these when in fact it might be more than the value of the, of the nutritional support. So the suggestion we have is that for all the kids who are on the PATH program and uh, nutritional support is sent either to Nutrition Products Limited or to the schools for them, it would be better to accumulate six weeks of these funds and add them to the PATH checks that the parents would be getting anyway. Um, the, the families who are on path uh, would benefit much more. It would leave them with a lot more um, purchasing power if they were given these as direct cash transfers rather than incurring the cost, whether by the schools, by you know, ADPEM, by uh, NGOs, to do the logistics of trying to distribute the actual um, food packages. The, there is six billion in the Ministry of Education's budget for this purpose. So if we assume, you know, that we even, that would cover eight months of schooling for the year. If we took two months of that, it would free up one and a half billion dollars to be available, say, in the next six weeks to be able to add to the path checks of the, of the path um, of the families who get nutritional support um, through the school. The other uh, point I would just make, again, to assist in planning to mitigate this, the ministry should be saying something now about what their sort of broad timetable they have for the PEP exams or what alternatives they have for it. They should be in consultation along with the other CARICOM countries um, to see what rescheduling can be done around the Caribbean Examination Council exams, the CXCs or the CAPE exams. These are things which if we address early, 
can help in the planning to mitigate um, the effects of the time lost due to the lockdown. Some schools, of course, are able to access remote learning um, fairly conveniently. And if there is a silver lining, it might be that uh, this crisis may accelerate the integration of technology into teaching and learning in our, um, in our schools. However, this will be uneven across different parts of Jamaica. Even within my own constituents, I can think the difference between those who live in the Mandeville Division versus the Belfield or not Patrick Division will be substantial. So once the administrators know the length of time they have to deal with, then they can start dealing with the mitigation plans uh, are not uh, forgotten and don't suffer unnecessarily either from lack of access to nutritional resources or to um, education, teaching and learning time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm going to invite Lisa to come in. And I know Lisa is dealing with a particular issue in her own constituency and is juggling. And just to reiterate to members of the press that we are using the digital platform today so that we can play our own role in ensuring that we have social distancing and we don't contribute further to the spread of the coronavirus. So over to you, Lisa. I, first of all, want to just say that I support the call from Peter and Mark and Maurice, but just to add, and in the last press conference that we did, I believe it was last week, we spoke about the fallout in the tourism industry and what would happen in terms of the restrictions on travel. And what we're seeing now is a number of hotels that are closing. I mean, I just, this morning, a number of, of workers are being sent home. Half Moon has said that it is going to be closing just so that it can mitigate the spread of the virus. What it will mean is there will be a fallout in persons having disposable income to do necessary things if you are out of work. The farmers in my constituency and other places who supply the hotels will probably have a problem in terms of resources. So there has to be another mechanism from the government to satisfy or to give a stimulus to small farmers and even some of the larger farmers who would have depended on markets. This is going to really have its deepest impact, as I said, some time ago on our tourism industry. And the government needs to figure out a way for all of the contract workers in particular, um, the house attendants, the gardeners, the bartenders who may not have work. And certainly for those persons who import manufactured goods from some of the countries, Wuhan, for instance, was shut down for, for a while. And so you're going to have delays in manufactured goods coming. So we just have to brace ourselves. Um, I'm sorry for the connection. I'm, I'm actually in Southeast dealing with a situation. Um, but just to support the call and to ask all Jamaicans to, to respect the protocols, respect the fact that as of today, you know, there are certain things in place. I know it is going to be difficult, but we just all have to work together to make sure that, you know, we contain the issue. All right, thank you very much, Lisa. I'm now going to invite members of the media to pose the questions. Just identify yourself and the media house that you represent and indicate which of our spokespersons you are directing the question to. Members of the media, are you hearing me? If you can identify yourselves and the questions you have and who you're directing them to. Hello, any members of the media hearing me? I hope we didn't lose them. Our admin, do we know if we have the media on? 
You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave because um the diver is supposed to be almost here. Um okay. and I need to throw this first. So good luck everybody and you me back again. Okay. Right. Oh dear. okay. Um we have a drone, somebody that just drowned. All right, video. understood. Yeah, stay close to the family. Yeah, man. Members of the media, do we have them? Let me try the chat. Malcolm. Testing. Yes, I'm hearing you. Go ahead. Hi, Julia and everybody else. Kimon Francis from The Observer. Hearing me? Right. Yes, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Go ahead, Kimon. All right, my question is for Dr. Morris Guy as it relates to the drug. Well, any one of you can answer. I know the opposition leader said that he has written to the government, re, you know, accessing the drug from Cuba. You can see, I can't remember the name, but in any event, what I want to know is has the opposition leader gotten a response from the government as it relates to this letter that he wrote with the drug from Cuba? Morris, you want to take that? I'm not aware that the leader of the opposition has received an answer. The Prime Minister and the Parliament yesterday acknowledged that he has received a letter. And, um, that, but, but, but what is interesting is that the minister subsequently later in the afternoon at a press conference indicated that his standards branch of the ministry was looking in to see whether this drug could be utilized. So the government is aware of it at this point in time. Okay. And I would expect that based on his response that they're taking steps to, 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 to assess its, 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 its usage, but we would urge that they do it much faster. Okay. Thanks. Are you okay, Kimon? Right. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other persons from the media? Oh, I see a question here from Debbie and Wright. Um, to Mr. Bunting, hold on. I joined a bit late, but I wondered how the suggestion from Mr. Bunting would work, as nutritional support would be required. Now, are you suggesting moving up the date for the next check? So, so Peter, I think the question is, how would they operationalize your recommendation? Um, and specifically, I think you were proposing a cash grant versus the physical food being delivered. So maybe you can just elaborate on that. Right. So essentially, the uh, PAR families, I believe, get that check uh, every fortnight. Uh, so the idea would be, and, and if it's longer than that, then certainly bring it forward so that you, you prepare all the checks this week. And But you add to the regular check that the family would get the amount which would be sent to the schools um, for nutritional support for the past students. So, you know, just as an example, if the, if the parent would get $10 and $5 would have been sent to the school um, each fortnight, then you take six weeks worth, so that's $15 that would have been sent to the school, add it to the, uh, the $10 pass check, and this next round of checks you would send out would be $25. And obviously, I'm just using that for illustrative purposes, not that that would be an amount. There, there are some questions which are coming in on the chat board. Um, this is from Edmund Campbell to Mark. Um, and I'm just quoting, you said that 10 billion contingency would not be adequate to mitigate the fallout. How much do you propose? And where would you suggest the government source the additional resources from considering the impact on the budget? I think that the question would be how you reallocate existing expenditures um, that are budgeted for given the crisis that we are now in. Um, the, the 10 billion that has been identified so far um, is Part of it is from a tax break that has been taken back, three billion, and the, the seven billion um, that is that has been announced as a contingency fund. Um, we are not 
sure exactly what the source is, but the primary surplus having been reduced does free up some fiscal resources um, for the government. <clears throat> the thing in the fiscal responsibility framework, it does contemplate that in a period of crisis from an exogenous shock of this type, that the government may need to forego the rigor of the primary surplus target um, for a period of time so as to ride the country through. That could be looked at as well. Um, so in terms of how you would fund it, you may have to, um, for the next three months or however long it lasts, you may need to adjust your expenditures so that um, you're upfronting these amounts um, from resources that you have to raise um, through taxes that are coming in already, or if necessary, from some domestic borrowing um, to ensure that the society isn't too damaged by this and that the recovery can be rapid once the virus passes. Um, I don't think that in our context, uh, if we were even to talk about 20 billion or plus of, of, of expenditure on this, um, I don't think that would be untoward. It would obviously need to be costed. Um, I'm not, I haven't attempted to cost all of it. I know, for example, that the, the idea of a $50,000 grant to each past family um, spent over the next two to three months would cost in the region of five to six billion dollars, I believe, based on our very rough calculations. That would have to be refined, obviously. But the, the cost to the society and to the economy of not reacting adequately protect those at the bottom of the society from the disruption and dislocation that is now unfolding could be that much greater. All right, I have two questions here from Debbie and Wright. Um, is the opposition in agreement with the proposals under the CARE program, particularly cash transfers? And I probably asked Mark to answer that. And then the second from Siobhan Campbell, the government has already waived custom duties on several of the items identified by Mark. Do you believe that the measure goes does not go far enough? So, yeah, probably yeah. Goes so the, the answer to that is, um, first of all, um, I don't think that, yes, I do agree with the, the idea of, as I said in my opening, maybe you didn't catch it, Debian, but in um, I do agree that the cash transfers to businesses in um, targeted sectors of the economy to enable them to continue to employ workers and the cash transfers to workers who may be laid off. I, I agree with both of those um, ideas. And in fact, I, I suggested a third one, um, which is that statutory contributions, a moratorium could be imposed on statutory contribution payments for the duration of the crisis. So you take that burden off employers as well. Um, if they keep their workers um, employed. So I do agree with both of the proposed measures and I was adding a third. Um, in relation to the items that have been subject to customs duty relief, that's fine and we're glad to see that. But we're also suggesting that GCT should be rolled back on them as well to minimize the cost to the consumer of the type of hygiene that is necessary, maintaining the hygiene that is necessary to reduce the spread of the virus. So. We don't think at this time it, it's good for the economy or the society to be charging GCT on items that are needed to be used in a greater volume than normal, soap and hand sanitizer, et cetera. And indeed on medications that persons who are affected and become symptomatic, and of course we hope this won't be very many, but based on what's happening internationally, we know that it could be quite substantial. And we would say that medicines ought not to be paracetamol and the type of medicines that are, are recommended for use um, if you do get affected by this virus. We should we don't think that VCT should be charged on those. Right, thank you, Mark. Um, to members of the media, are there any further questions that you want to ask of us before we um, wrap up? Okay, there's a question to uh, Maurice Guy from Erica Virtue. How many ICU spaces do we have available as of today? How many anesthesiologists have been fitted with masks to treat persons 
needing ICU care, especially at KPH? Um, I know that we have a combination of 25 ICU and high dependency units here. Um, there are, I think, um, in excess of just about 20, 25, which are to be taken into, into um, use. These are the ProMac units that have been built at Spanish Town Hospital, St. Anthony Hospital, which will provide some amount of um, 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 sterile facility in this type of treatment. But specifically to the question of the ICU beds, I think there are only about 25 in the country. Um, I'm not certain about um, the, the, the training of the anesthesiologist at KPH in the use of, of, of the, the master set. All right, thank you. Let me, are there any other questions? I'll just, again, recap what our proposals are for the benefit of those who may have joined that we're proposing that there be a 50,000 um, cash transfer to families on the PATH program, that the government moves very quickly to get the drug from Cuba that we believe will be beneficial to persons who have tested positive for the coronavirus, that we increase the benefit under the PATH program to six weeks to those persons who are on the program so that they can be they can go through this very difficult period and that we believe that we will have to extend the closure of schools beyond the original two-week period to ensure that we contain the interactions and obviously the social distancing which is needed to contain the virus. Are there any questions from members of the media before we close off? Okay, if not, let me thank, thank the members of the media who joined, thank my colleagues for participating, and just to say to you that we will continue to use this type of technology to um, communicate with you so we can play our role in minimizing the spread of the coronavirus. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day.